Hi everyone, welcome. And, uh, thank you, thank you for coming for this um, panel discussion on uh, film and literature um, on, in terms of remembering and genocide. As you all know, for approximately 100 days in 1994, between April 7 and mid-July, an estimated 800,000 to 1 million Rwandans perished. These numbers would equate to 20% of the overall population and 70% of Tutsis living in Rwanda at the time. Despite the evidence of what was happening, the world remained largely silent and those who spoke were drowned out by expressions like inter-ethnic conflict, tribal war, and acts of genocide. On June 10, 1994, Christine Shelley of the State Department invoked once again acts of genocide, to, we, to which she reported asked, how many acts of genocide does it take to make genocide? The citizens of the world were largely silent, distracted perhaps by the suicide of Fred Cobain, the election of Nelson Mandela, and the World Cup. The leaders of the world seemed to be engaging in word games to avoid being legally obligated to act against the genocide that was clearly taking place. It seems that after every human tragedy, we sing like broken records the song of never again. After the Holocaust, the world screamed never again. And then came Cambodia, Bosnia, Rwanda, and ongoing since 2003, Darfur. It never ends. Is it a question of forgetting? If so, how do we keep the tragic past in our collective memory so that we can avoid tragic futures? Today's panel is organized around the question of reconstituting the collective memory in the wake of human tragedies like the Rwandan genocide. The main question around which this panel is structured concerns the role of literature and film in the remembrance of genocide. Since 1994, there has been a whole corpus of books, mostly written in the cadre of Rwanda and the Rwanda memoir, that constitutes a genre of post-genocide literature. Similarly, there have been numerous films regarding numerous films made regarding the genocide in Rwanda. Our discussion today will evoke these two bodies of work to analyze what might be the unique contribution to post-genocide discourse. To begin, we'll watch a five-minute film directed by one of the panelists, Sam Kopman, entitled Massacre in Morambi. But first, let me introduce them, after which Sam Kopman will talk a little bit about his work. Sam Copeland is professor of film at Boston University, where he teaches film production and motion picture editing. In 2004, he was a Fulbright scholar and taught production at Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. In 2006, he taught at the National University of Rwanda and as a Fulbright senior specialist. The next year, he directed the award-winning film Massacre in Rambi, which we're going to watch today, which was also added on the PBS series POV. In 2009, he was a Guggenheim well, Virginie Michel Jean Charles is an assistant professor of French and of African and African diaspora studies at Boston College. She is the author of the recently published book Conflict Politics, sorry, Conflict Bodies, The Politics of Great Representation in the Francophone Imaginary. Her research interests include Francophone African and Caribbean literatures and cultures, gender studies, violence and representation, and human rights in the humanities. And without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Professor Tolkien. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to give sort of a brief overview of, of sort of the events that led up to the um, genocide. And perhaps for those of you, this will be uh, you know, very thin and not very in-depth. Maybe for those of you who don't know that much about it, it might help you understand what we'll be talking about. So when you think about Africa, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a continent that was um, really divided up by European powers back in the end of the um, uh, 1800s, such that, um, you know, powers like Germany, France, Britain, Belgium, and Portugal, and Italy, and the Netherlands, um, you know, found areas that they were interested in exploiting, grabbed them, and then in 1885, the conference in Berlin, you know, that, that, that basically everyone agreed, these European powers, that we were, they're going to recognize each other's sphere of influences. Now, the, the land grabs that they made had nothing to do with who lived in those places, but really it was about the, the geographical setup or what crops were there or what, you know, um, 
what, what, whether it was close to an ocean or a river or whatever. So it really made no sense in terms of who lived there. Um, the other thing that's important to understand is that this wasn't that they were doing it for anything other than to exploit the, the, the people and the resources of these areas that they took over. Um, it wasn't about development at all. So consequently, you know, one of the things that the European powers did was they said, well, which group of the ethnic groups that are in this country that we have taken over, in this land, you know, will be the best allies for us? In Rwanda, it became the Tutsis, which were only about 10% of the population. But to the Germans who were taking over Rwanda, the Germans felt that the Tutsis looked more European and so would be more likely to be like us. So this, the minority population, this 10% of the country, got all the government posts, you know, with the teachers, the professors. And so obviously the people who were the majority population, the Hutu, resented this a great deal. So over time, during the course of, of um, the, you know, the 10s and the 1910 and 1920, that resentment built up. But um, then after World War I, Germany gave up its colonial powers because it lost the war. And Belgium took over. And so Belgium, in order to keep the, the, the machinery working, you know, kept the, the Tutsis as, as their favorite group. And they went so far as to actually classify the, the three ethnic groups in Rwanda and having people have passes be registered as a Hutu, as a Tutsi, or as a Twa, which is a very small group. So, um, when you think about the kind of system that went, so this was going through the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, and then in Africa during the 60s, there was this great deal sort of the winds of change. Um, you know, the, the, the countries there were starting to say that we can do this, we can run ourselves, this is, you know, there's little changes taking place all over the world. And so um, the, the European powers were um, willing to, you know, give up their colonies as, as long as they kept their influence. So um, basically in Rwanda, um, you had a situation where um, the, the Belgians turned over independence in, I think it was like 1962. Um, but prior to that, they had uh, worked, had, had met this, this huge um, uh, sort of backlash from the Hutu and so they, um, when they gave up independence and there were elections, obviously the majority population, which is the Hutu, was going to take power. So now, now you have a total flip. You have the Hutu who were once the, the, the oppressed. Now they, they are in a position. And so you know, it, everything was about ethnicity. It wasn't about us as a nation. It wasn't us about a colony. It was about who are you? Are you Tutsi or are you a Hutu? And so, so then from 19... Um, 73 to 1993, um, the Hutu were in power. Um, they, uh, you know, they themselves over time found a lot of resentment from the Tutsi. And so the Tutsi um, were actually, uh, some of them were in exile, and um, they formed the Rwandan Patriotic Front or RPF, and they had skirmishes over, you know, many years to try to get some of the power back that had been taken away from them. And so there was actually a treaty that took place. Um, in 1993, that was to give some power back to the Tutsis. They were going to have positions in government. They were going to have some power. And this really angered the more extreme elements of the Hutu. So um, you have all these sort of angers, boiling ethnicity, um, and each side, you know, saw each other as, um, well, mostly the Hutu saw, you know, the Tutsi, they call them cockroaches, and no total dehumanization taking place. But it all comes through all those years of oppression from the, being out of power. So um, basically, the, the, the event that, that kicked off the whole uh, killing happened in, in um, April 6, when just 20 years ago yesterday, the, the president flying back from a conference in Tanzania was his plane was shot down. This is an excuse. There's no longer a president who's going to be working with the Tutsis. We don't have to have a president who, who's starting to give power to the Tutsis. We can get rid of the Tutsis. And so, um, as uh, 
you mentioned 100 days of slaughter. Um, so, so just to explain a little bit, this film isn't about the genocide. It's much more about how we dealt with the genocide. So um, it's only five minutes. And after the film, I'll talk a little bit about the making of the film and, and, and where the, the idea came from and how, you know, how the film has come together. If you can get the lights, I can do it. Et donc, nous terminons cette 
histoire comme nous l'avons commencé. Par un mensonge. So, so there's a woman who worked for Boston University in the, in the room, 
Spanish language department, um, and she agreed to be the narrator, which she'd never narrated before. But, but to me, I, I mean, you know, I'm still in contact with her, and I think her voice is so good, you know, that it really, um, you know, made the film, you know, much more powerful. And then it's one of the things that this film needed music, because obviously, you know, words can give meaning, but music gives feeling. So there's a film that you might have seen um, called Requiem for a Dream. Has anyone ever seen that film? Uh, Clint Nedsell is the composer. And what you do when you make a film like this is you take copyrighted music and you, it's temporary. You're not going to use the music in the final film, but you use it to help make the edits and things like that. So I used clips from that, you know, segments from that film, and, and made this bed of, of music that works so, so well that I was like, how can I ever get anything to be as good as this? Well, so I, I knew that I needed to get the rights from it, and so I did. I got Clint Mansell liked the, the film, and so he and the, you know, I had to get the publishers, the, all these different rights. It cost me about um, $1,200, and so I got the rights and I sent the film out, and every festival I submitted it to, it, it got into. I mean, it's just like, and at one festival called Media That Matters in New York, one of the judges there was uh, works for PBS, and he loved the film, and he said, you know, we want to broadcast it on PBS. And I said, okay, but I don't have the rights to that. So I went back to find out what the rights to what the rights would cost to put it on the air. It was like thirty thousand dollars. Well, I don't have thirty thousand dollars. So then I got this wonderful composer from Berkeley. April Thomas to, to write the score, and I don't know why I didn't go to her in the first place. Because I do think that the music makes this much more powerful. So, so basically, as I say, um, I don't know if you guys know the story of Ezekiel. Do you know that in the Bible? Um, well, so Ezekiel is, is, the reason he's famous is because Samuel Jackson does a, a thing from Ezekiel in Pulp Fiction. Have you ever seen that film? know that speech. Well, Ezekiel is called out by, by the Lord to come in and breathe life into these bones. And, 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 and I sort of felt like that was what I was there to do, is to try to breathe life into these bones. And so, um, anyway, the film has gone on, I think, it's on YouTube, I think over a million some people have watched it. But, but because it always surprised me because really what I'm saying to them is, you know, you, you know, it's a film that sort of attacks the viewer, attacks, you know, because it really was sort of about the anger that I felt you know, myself for being part of, of, of a a lot of this So, thank you so much, Mister. I really enjoyed the references that you made to Ezekiel in particular, and there's, you know, um, this idea of the dry bones standing. Um, so I'm going to stay seated, if that's okay. My voice travels pretty well, um, and, <laughs> and I have, you know, I'm going to read a little bit, but I'm also going to just talk to you about what you just saw, um, but also about the project of remembering genocide in general through literature, through film, through cultural production, through visual culture as well. Uh, so the first thing I want to say, I want to ask you, is how many people have seen the film Hotel Rwanda? Raise your hands. How many people have seen the film? Have you seen the film Hotel Rwanda? Yes. Okay. So, how many people have seen the film Sometimes in April? Okay. Um, how many of you have seen films other than this one? Not Hotel Rwanda, not Sometimes in April, not this one, about the Rwanda. Your hand is still raised. About the Rwanda genocide. Yeah. What did you see? It's a French documentary. What's like, it called? I can't remember the name, but it was. Uh, friends too did this this channel did, did okay. a great documentary on that. Okay, okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I did the same. I think it's yeah. Probably the same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Ah, okay, okay. Um okay. So my the reason why I ask this is because because um one of the things that I'm really interested in is how do texts about genocide get circulated, right? And so you'll see, I think we have the most number of hands when I ask about Hotel Rwanda, right? 
Um, and so Hotel Rwanda was a Hollywood produced film, right? And so because of that, it had a kind of circulation, at least in the US, that perhaps other films didn't. Sometimes in April was an HBO produced film, right? So um, it, in that sense, it got, you know, it, it had a, a, a broad, a wider viewership, though not as wide as something like Hotel Rwanda, but it still had, you know, it was geared towards a particular audience. I'm sure that this film, because it was shown to a French audience, it was geared to a French audience, had kind of a different set. It, it, it enters into the discourse of genocide. When we say the discourse, the way that we talk about genocide, the way that we remember genocide, in a particular way because of the context, right? So um, that's important for us, especially when we think about what is called the crisis of representation. The crisis of representation is basically a term that we use in literary studies and cultural studies about the use of art to represent reality, right? So this tension between reality and representation. It's most often referred to in the context of atrocities, um, whether it's violence, um, whether it's Sam brought up, you know, the Holocaust, um, or slavery, right? So we could also consider a film like 12 Years a Slave participates in this crisis of representation by representing the violence of slavery. Films that represent violent events, they can be historic events, it can also be um, events that are personal events, it can be a film about sexual violence, it can be a film about child, childhood sexual abuse, it can be a film about um, any sort of traumatic experience that someone has had. Right, that is a real life traumatic experience. And so the question becomes then, how do you use film, and how do you use literature, and how do you use art to represent these realities that are difficult realities? What role can literature play? What role can documentaries play? Which, what, what role can film play in representing um, atrocity? And I like the way, I'm gonna give you a, a quote from um, Stuart Hall, who uh, the late Stuart Hall, who was a, 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 br a black British cultural theorist, and he says this, he says, against the urgency of people dying in the streets, what in God's name is the point of cultural studies? So basically the question is this, what is the point of making a film about it? What is the point of writing a book about it? When this thing happened and all of these people died, and nobody paid attention, right? A lot of, well, you could say the West, if the West was ever ready to, then it would be paid attention. But <laughs> the West did not pay attention. The US did not pay attention. People did not intervene. What is the point of creating this art? Um, so my argument is that literature and, so both cultural, produ cu cultural production, when I say cultural production, I mean literature, film, drama, um, television, uh, poetry, prose, photography, right? So cultural production, just to use as a broad term to encompass all of those. Cultural production is able to affect us in a way that um, can broaden the scope of the issue. So, for example, we just saw this, this um, film about Murambi, right? Perhaps we'd heard about the Rwandan genocide, but perhaps we'd never heard of Murambi, right? So now we know a little bit more about Murambi, right? We know a little bit more about the genocide. And if you look at the way that the images are constructed on the scene, it's a short, right? It's not a long film. It's a short. But the way that it operates is to really begin to kind of signal or signal some interest for the, for, the, for the viewer, right? So you start to think, you, you see a little bit, you see the images, you see the skulls. You have, again, the somber music, which is generates feeling, right? And that kind of ignites your feelings of empathy. Um, and also feelings of curiosity as well that can make you then go on to learn more about the genocide. I also think that it's important to remember that these texts play a role for the audience, for the reader or for the viewer, but they also play a role for the creator, right? So that as Sam said, he was channeling his rage, his rage at the fact that his country, the United States of America, did not react, right? So he was channeling his rage into creativity. So there's a way in which um, this text operates at a broad level in terms of, like he said, remembering those, letting the dry bones dance, but it also operates for him personally as a text that he's able to use to kind of channel his rage. And I would submit to you, and this is something that I argue in my book, that a lot of times with these texts of genocide, there's a struggle that is evident, right? There's a struggle that the writer or that the filmmaker is going through in order to even be able to produce this text. Now you're saying, you know, what does that mean? I know a lot of you read, for example, um, Murambi, right? Le Livre des Osmans by Boubacar And um, in, that, in that book, um, one of the things that we see 
is uh, the use of multiple narratives, right? Which is, well, let me tell you a little bit. For the people that didn't read the book, how many people read the book? Okay, so about maybe half. So, when you talk about the Rwandan genocide, another issue that came with the genocide is that because it was a conflict that unfolded on the African continent, and as you said, you know, you give us this longer colonial history, there's a way that, um, there's a set of ideas or there's a dominant discourse about the African continent that people already believe, right? So as part of the colonial project, in order to justify colonialism, there were a certain, there were a number of myths that had to be created about Africa. Africans are barbarous, Africans are savage, Africans are violent, right? These were all part of the colonial project, right? So when you think about, for example, 18th century, 19th century, you know, literature and some of the ways in which Africans are pathologized, this is all part of the colonial project. So the problem then becomes, when something like a genocide happens, how do you represent the genocide without falling back on these scripts that, oh, this is an African problem. Of course, this is happening on, in this country, right? How do you do that? Now, African writers in particular uh, were really invested in being able to present images of the genocide that didn't fall into that old vocabulary, that didn't fall into this reductive reasoning, right? That, that was saying that, oh, of course this is happening because these are Africans, and ethnic strife happens on the African continent at the time. African writers, in particular, a group called um, the uh, Rwanda, no, I feel the translation in my head, Rwanda Our Duty to Remember Collective, this group of writers, um, it was actually a group of writers who, and I'm sure of those of you who read the novel already heard about it, but I'm just going to read um, So this group of writers, they were actually part of the Fest Africa Project, which is a, a, a writing conference for African writers. And they were in France, and they were all just sitting around talking, and they were talking about the genocide. And they were really frustrated because they realized that there were very few texts by Africans that were presenting the genocide. So if you look even at the archive, if you look at, if you were to do a Google search and you were to look up documentary about, uh, or film about the Rwandan genocide, or documentary about the Rwandan genocide, or even just look in your library for books about the Rwandan genocide, you will find a whole, a lot of French, a lot of French book, books written by French, a lot of um, documentaries like the ones that these gentlemen mentioned, um, made by French. You'll find um, the Belgians are also in there. Uh, but they were disturbed by how few Africans who were not from Rwanda, right, because that's a very important distinction to me. The Rwandese were, were writing their testimony. Someone like Yolande Mukagasana, who was the first Rwandese to write um, her testimony of what happened to her in the genocide, and then went on to write other books and actually created this amazing project that travels as a set of photographs um, that shows encounters between victims and perpetrators of the genocide. So you had Rwandese who were writing about this. You had Europeans. Um, you had Philip Gorovich. <laughs> um, and then there was a gap, right? And so these group of writers, they said, well, you know, we as Africans should be concerned about this. Even though it didn't happen in our country, we should be concerned about this. And we should really represent this through our work. So they decided to go travel to Rwanda, visit sites of genocide, and produce texts. There, were no, there weren't any parameters, they just said you had to produce a text. So some of them wrote prose, some of them wrote, one person wrote a play, somebody wrote Véronique Tadjo, who's a, a writer from Côte d'Ivoire, she wrote a travel narrative, right? Well, a text that I think is really genreless, but essentially a travel narrative. Um, and you had all these different texts that were being produced. Yes, because they wanted to um, show the world, right, different ways of thinking about the genocide, but also because of their own internal struggle of dealing with it themselves, right? So it served a purpose for them, just as it also served a purpose for the world. So this group, um, the, Fest, the Fest Africa Initiative, um, they, um, they traveled and they visited the sites and then they, each of them produced a text, and then they went back, right? They went back, oh, I can't remember how many years later, but they went back some years later, um, again, so they did two, not just one trip to Rwanda, but two trips to Rwanda. And what's fascinating, if you've ever, I know some of you here have had opportunities to meet Rebecca, right, Boris Dio? Was he here last year? He was here last year. No? No? Jamie? Oh. Never mind. Um, well, if, if you ever, so if you ever have the opportunity to meet any of these writers, one, there's one gentleman, um, Ubaka Boris Dio, who wrote Murambi, the book, which has the same title as this one. Um, he, 
always talks about what people said to him as he was speaking to them. There were people that said to him, so the survivors of the genocide that he spoke with when he went to Rwanda, they said to him, there was one person that said to him, please uh, don't write fiction. Don't write stories about what happened to us. Don't make up what happened to us. The world needs to know that what happened to us is real, right? Now, of course, he then went on to write a novel. But why would he not listen to what the person told him? What, how did he reconcile that, right? So in the, in the book itself, you see this struggle because there's a character in the novel who is basically someone that was not in Rwanda during the genocide, comes back, and him, he himself is writing a play. Is it a play that he's writing? He's writing, he's writing a play about the genocide. And it's this kind of absurd text, right? And um, I don't want to give it too much of it away. But the point of it being that through this character, he's able to work out some of those anxieties about what does this actually mean, right? So it kind of, you know, it operates almost, um, it's metatextual, right? When we say metatextual, that means the text is referring to itself. Because you see this character grappling with what does it mean? What is the point? Why write this? Especially in the face of encountering these atrocities and encountering what my own, the ways in which my own family was complicit, right? So I would say that the, the, these, these texts um, that we read and the texts that we see um, that represent the genocide are often kind of struggling through the form, at the formal elements of the text are struggling with how to even take on the representation. Veronique Tadjo does it in her book, The Shadow of Imana, by giving us a, a number of different texts, right? So at one point, it, it's, you, you read poetry. At another point, it's journalistic account. It reads like a journal entry. Uh, at another point, it's an interview that she's having with someone. At another point, it reads almost like this lyrical narrative. So by, by playing with the genre, um, she's able to show this struggle, the struggle of representation, the crisis of representation. Um, so, I said I wasn't going to say much. Okay. So, uh, okay, a few other things. Um, I think that with regards to the our duty to remember project, it's really unique as a project because it was a Pan African project because. Um, it was it was really the first time that a group of African writers had, had done a project like this, right? So that's what really makes it significant and groundbreaking. Um, and again, if you look at the cor the entire corpus of the Our Duty to Remember, that all different texts were produced. Uh, but I also think that these authors, that the authors who participated in the project, were very much um, committed to a social justice idea, right? And I'm saying social justice, not just because. Professor of Boston College, we love to talk about social justice. But because, you know, when you talk about human rights, and when you talk about remembering something that was forgotten, right, when you talk about something that was ignored, uh, Boubacar Boulis Diop calls it le double genocide, the double genocide, the fact that the genocide happened, and then the fact that the genocide did not make the international presses, right, did not register on the international, um, on the international scale that it should have. Um, so when you have something like le double genocide, and it's, it's, it's um, not being addressed in that time. To address it later on is an act of social justice, right? It's an act of commemoration. It's an act of um, remembrance, right? It's an act of reconciliation as well. And so a lot of these, you'll find with the, 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 the Rwandese who are taking on these projects are really invested in an idea of reconciliation as well because that is, a, that is a human rights initiative that you have to take on in the aftermath of the genocide. Um, I'm going to say just about, with regards to this film, a few things that I think, the, the ways in which I think the film kind of ties into what I'm talking about with regards to the crisis of representation and the role that visual culture can, put, can play in representing genocide, um, is particularly the way that he establishes the context, right? So if you look, when the film starts, um, he uses this idea of uh, the mensonge, the lie, right? So it starts out with this lie. And I love the way that they say, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité, and invoking this lie um, of these major tenets of the French nation, right, that it is built upon. And with, by invoking these universalist values, but then kind of critiquing them, right, because there's a lot that happens from um, liberté, égalité, fraternité to the Rwandan genocide, right, and part of that is, 
you know, also about the colonial project. Um, it's about uh, the, the, the complicity of the French in the genocide as well. Um, it's about um, this, this kind of national, you know, the du genocide, as as Boubacar Boulissio put it. So what Sam is doing when he introduces the film in this way is also kind of plugging the reader, plugging the viewer in to a longer um, set of discourses, right? So you're so we're told already from from the beginning. We're told, okay, this is what you think it is. Here's one thing we've been told. But here is the reality. Here's how it actually unfolded, right? And then even when you see the shot of the way that the shots change, right? You see some shots of people where he says, "What were you doing?" And then you see kind of ordinary shots of people, you know, sitting around enjoying life in a context that is not Burundi, right? Um, and again, by a, a pull, I think that that sort of back and forth is also a way of thinking about what we call positionality, right? So positionality is how do I, as a viewer, enter a text? How do I, as a director, enter this text, right? What are the different ways in which I, as um, a Haitian American professor who was, well, I don't know how old I was at the time, say, well, it was 20 years ago, so, who was 15 at the time, how do I enter into this, um, this, this, di this, representation of the genocide, right? And so there's a way that you kind of implicate the viewer as well. Um, and that the, when you see that type, of, that type of dynamic where the reader or the viewer is being implicated, it's also about responsibility, right? So this takes us to the age-old question of engagement in the French context, right? What does it mean to be um, an engaged thinker? What does it mean to be someone who understands that relationship between the text between the representation and the reality, and to actually care about it in a way that might lead to something greater. Uh, regardless of that means making a film, going on to you know read more, maybe read the entire corpus of the Écoute or research more about other genocides that are happening around you. So I think that um, in, the, in this film, you kind of see that back and forth in the beginning, but that it's also very, um, I think what, what struck me the most about this film was the way that kind of the shots move in relation to the music. And um, I agree completely with what Sam was saying in terms of the music producing this feeling for you. Because as a viewer, you're kind of taking in, you're taking in the skulls, and you're taking in um, the, these sites that are um, at the museum. Um, but then that music is happening at the same time. And I wondered, you know, sometimes when you watch these films, it's, it's good to turn down the volume and to see, just say, okay, what is it that I'm seeing, and how does the music kind of change that, right? And I think that that was, you know, the filmmaker's really intentional way of wanting to leave the viewer with this kind of heavier message, right? And then finally, you know, at the end, I mean, if that's not implicating the, the viewer, I don't know what is, when he says, you know, the, everyone, they're, look, they're white now. If they had been white, it would have mattered more, more and now they're white. So, um, you know, this documentary, I think, is an example of the ways that you can use formal techniques and you can use um, the image to implicate your viewer, but also to kind of leave, a, leave them with a charge, right? A kind of charge or a call to action for the viewer. And I think that these books, the books that make up this corpus of the Ikino Padre Padre Memoir Project do the same thing. And I think that I will stop speaking because we do want to leave time for questions. Um, but I would say the thing that just to leave you with is you know, to think about, especially today, when we have, um, we place so much value on sound bites or 140 characters or a status, what is it about um, a film that will, has to sustain your attention for a longer period of time? Or what is it about really delving into a novel about something? How, how is that different than reading a headline? Um, how is that different from, you know, linking to an article about it? And how does that impact you? And what do you do, right? The so what, which is what Stuart Hall asked. So what, you know, after that? What, what do you do after you see those texts? Well, thank you very much. We, um, we have a couple of minutes for, um, for questions now, but we're going to try to we're try to keep it as short as possible because we're going to try to get to the uh, the vigil that's going to be happening at Marsh Plaza at about seven fifteen. Anyone want to start us off? Yeah. I have kind of two questions that are pretty related. So, and um, I guess the first is kind of maybe more of an observation of what I'm hearing, especially um, listening to you talk about the collective 
Um, but I do think with regards to Bubaka Bogustio, he's extremely well known, period, because he's a journalist, because he's constantly after the French in his journalism. He's very, um, he's Senegalese, right? So there's also a kind of dominance of Senegalese in the Francophone canon of Senegalese in general. Yeah, let's go ahead. Uh, unfortunately, genocide is not purely or primarily an African phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And the one that I know the best, and I assume that's true for everybody else in the room, is the Holocaust, yeah. about which there's been an enormous amount written and lots and lots of movies. And most of the stuff is from the point of view of the people that suffer. Not very much is from the point of view of the oppressors. Not too many German show books about how they shot Jews in the back mm -hmm. of the head. But there are a fair number about Jews who escaped into the forest or about the piano player that hid in the apartment for a long time or the woman that had to choose between the two children on the platform in Auschwitz. So where is that literature? Is there a literature like that or rooms like that by Rwandans that went through this? Absolutely, absolutely. So you're saying the literature of survivors, right? Well, that's mostly what the Holocaust literature Right, was. but you're saying where is the literature of the survivors of the, of the Rwandan well, genocide? Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen that, but, but more broadly, can, can you compare the cultural things that have come out of the Rwanda genocide to the cultural things that came out of the Holocaust? So I, I'm not an expert on the Holocaust. I mean, I don't know as much about the text that came out of the Holocaust. Uh, but based on what you just said, I do think that it is true that there are more texts by the victims than there are by the perpetrators. And I think that there's a lot. Of, I think you'll see a trend, right? So in the beginning, you're seeing a lot of testimonials. Um, a lot of um, you know people giving their testimonies that survived and what happened to them. So like that woman that I mentioned, Yolanda Muka Gasana, was one of the first people to write that. She wrote subsequent ones. Um, she writes also the story about um, the Tutsi, the the Hutu woman who helped her. Um, and then and then there was this project. But then after that project, there were slowly more fiction texts have been coming out that are also about the genocide, right? So I think that there is a way where you get. First, it's the testimonies. You know, if I had to talk about the trajectory, I would say the first kind of 10 years, you know, after you're seeing mostly first person testimonies and accounts. And then I would say that now, you know, in the, in the, in the past 10 years now, you're seeing some, you know, fictive um, representation uh, in both, uh, in both, in, actually, there, there are some films also that have come out by Rwandans in the past, like, five years. Um, and so I would say that that's the way that, that's the way the trajectory is going. And I would say, um, not based on you know what I mean, not based on what I know about the Holocaust or even the um, Rwandan genocide, but I think I also do a lot of work on Haiti and um, the way that people write about the dictatorship, for example. That in the past, uh, so it's maybe been twenty five years, right? And so if you in the past five years, the the phase that happens after after you have the testimonies, after you have the um, the, the, fic, the fictive accounts, then you have, um, I think then after that is when you start to see people engaging in the fiction, the idea of, of perpetrators and, and victims coming together, right? And so then one could theorize that maybe after that is when you'll see text based entirely on the perpetrators or perpetrators themselves who are coming out to write. But now I think part of the problem is also because of the, um, um, the legal aspect of it, in terms of the human rights, in terms of the, the cases that have been big part of these perpetrators as well. But I do think it's, it, it, there's a possibility that, you know, unlike you know the, the Holocaust, I mean, knowing um, I mean, the, the laws and the, the, uh, the courts and, the, and the, the sort of the criminal justice system saw everyone there as as a criminal, quite rightly so, and so you're not going to have many accounts. But, but here in Rwanda, it's possible, given that there has been a reconciliation with the mm -hmm. courts, and the, the, you know, in the, some of the photographs of, of the perpetrator mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and, and the victim joining and forgiving each other. Mm -hmm. So it's possible mm -hmm. it, because there are now people have gotten out of prison. Five have, years later, yeah, right? Have, yeah. Have, have, so it's possible that, unlike the Holocaust, there will be people who will be willing to talk about their role. Um, but think about, let's take, how many documents are there where, the, from the per perpetrator's perspective? I mean, very, very few. I mean, I think in apartheid, you know, remember, you ever read um, My Traitor's Heart? That's a, about the only book that I, I can think of. Where, and also, Emmanuel Lombardo. Uh-huh. 
There's a very, very few. Mm -hmm. but, but I do think that it's possible that possibly, possibly in Rwanda, because of yeah. the whole route of the reconciliation, that you would have the opportunity to mm -hmm. maybe proceed to that people that a, a, a journalist or writer work with the yeah. Yes, um, I come from a field of international relations. So I've heard that you two are not the first saying it, and both of you have said this, and I've been writing your book for you. But um, I've heard you say the French were complicit in the genocide. How exactly were they complicit? Because that's a heavy accusation today. And the French, in the think of French literature, French philosophy, you have Camus, you have Sartre, all these great things of enlightenment. How is that with the French conference in the New York Times? please, I'll explain that to you. So, uh, I'm trying to see how much time we have here before I answer, begin to answer that. Um, Bubaka Bolis Diop actually writes about this a lot, and I would, I'll, 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 I'll pull up whenever we talk to later, I'll, I'll point you to some of the books in which she writes about this. Um, but I would say, in kind of to give you a, a thumbnail, um, so the French were, um, they, so there was a, a history of the French getting, uh, giving arms to the Hutu, right? So I would say through the armistice, through the giving the arms to the Hutus, not during the genocide, but leading up to the genocide as well. And then there was um, with um, what was called Operation Turquoise, um, when the French were, so this was in the process of you know, ending the genocide, um, when they were, the French were being taken out, the, the, the um, French uh, representatives of the French um, government, right, were taken out of Rwanda. Um, and all the, you know, the, the people who were French, essentially, the way that it often happens when you have crises, international crises, um, were taken out of Rwanda. And um, there were, you know, Rwandese who were kind of left there that they were responsible for because they had been told that this um, particular part of, of of Rwanda was under the under the guidance or under the protection of Operation Turquoise. But then when Operation Turquoise failed, those people were all kind of killed and just left there, right? Um, so. I'll leave it at that for now, but I think that, but I, I think it's important to say that um, it has been documented, and the main, the main, um, the main way in which the French were involved was by providing arms, right? Which we've seen, you know, historically again with um, former colonial powers providing arms to uh, different militia groups in African countries. Um, so they were providing arms for the, the yeah. But from what I hear, most of the people who were killed were killed by machetes. Mm. So the French they were the ones who gave them machetes. Yes. The ones yes. killed by, by guns. Most of the people were killed by machetes. Mm. Yeah, and they, they, that's right. So, so from my understanding, that the transfer of arms was mostly machetes from the French. Really? Yeah. And then also, after, during the, the last few days of the, of the genocide, um, when the you know the Rwandan Patriotic Front um, took over Kigali and, and basically the French were were the ones who let facilitated two million Hutu from leaving the country and going to Congo. Wow. So so it, it, instead of having these people face justice, they were given basically escorted out of the country yes. by the French who were who were in charge of, of um, claiming that part of Rwanda. And the Belgians were played because the French were never the colonial masses in Rwanda. Right. Yeah. It yeah. was the Germans and the Belgians. Right. So, How so the French get that dominance? Oh, because the imagination of Belgium and Belgium are small, they just take over the French own sphere. Well, so what happens from my understanding was that you know you have um, a real you know the whole French love of the, of the French language yeah. and the fact that you know if if the one if Patriot Front comes into power. They're much more British English speaking than the French, and they were worried that, that, that the language, the French language, were the Tutsi to come back and take over, the French language would be, um, you know, come secondary in the country. So, so that desire to have French be the, the spoken, the primary language in Rwanda had a lot to do with the, the French government's involvement in supporting the Hutu government. There's a, a book on this, I can't remember the gentleman, Gérard Pignier, something like that. Um, the role of the French in the Rwandan genocide, so I'm going to try to get that 
If, so if we are to understand it as a kind of testimonial, the question becomes what what are what is the testimony about, right? And so I think that, you know, just as we saw in the film, that he is also, it's about this experience of witnessing um, of, 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 of these sites of memory, right? Of traveling to these sites of memory and seeing the aftermath, right? So for you, it was also about, you know, giving a testimony about this experience in the museum, right? Which is what a lot of those authors do, what Tedra says that she's doing. And so I think it would be a mistake to think of that kind of testimonial as the same as you know a first-person account of someone who experienced that, right? Because your testimony—it's the difference between testifying. Uh, it's the difference between experiencing the event in the aftermath and the way the, the event is being remembered versus experiencing the event um, in the first person. Uh, so I would say there is a, there is a difference. Um, but as far as the testimonial genre operates, um, I think broadly, you know, you could understand them as having some of the same effects, right? So the use of the first person, the use of different, um, uh, the use of different um, kind of narrative techniques that kind of move in, in when the first person is no longer, no longer works for the, for the, the narrator. And for me, you know, I think if I, you know, if I were um, a survivor of the genocide, you know, I wouldn't be able to do what I can do, which is like, for instance, there's a, there's a shot where we're talking about your government with very, you know, the, very, you know, you, the, your government, um, uh, you know, run, run, um, grabbing their hands, you know, to, well, there's a shot of the hand, or, or you know, or the, the taking the, the, the woman and the child, you know, the, the African woman and the child, and then putting it against the, the white bleached bones and saying, and now they're, they're you know, now they're white. Well, I, I can do that because I'm distant from it, but it's a powerful point that if you're, that's your family. You're never going to go there. You know what I'm saying? You're never going to touch that because it would be almost um, sacrilegious, perhaps, to, to, to make those connections, to have a, an arm up in the air that's frozen like that and then use that to work with the music and the narration. But this is why I think someone like Yolanda, and I know I've mentioned her about five times now, but Yolanda Bogueira-Sana is so important because she was a survivor who wrote her testimony wrote two versions, two versions of her testimony, and then wrote, published, edited a collection of testimonies by other survivors, right? So you see their progression, because she writes her own story first, but then she gets other Wendy's to tell their own stories as well. Um, and then after that, she moved on to this other project, which was the visual project, which was the film, you know, the photography project. I think it's time for about um, either one of the panelists to Either, either two short questions or, or one long one. <laughs> <laughs> yep, please go ahead. Um, I have a question about the role of fiction and nonfiction in the representation of the genocide. And just for you personally, do you feel like there's a line or a certain ratio that should be obtained between fiction and nonfiction, and, or if it should just be pretty writing about the genocide and how, um, and how that, you know, how much is fact, how much is statistics, and how much are the real accounts? And when you say a ratio, do you mean within a given text, a ratio? Well, I will tell you right now that I'm against a ratio. I mean, I'm against a formula, right? That would be rigid for the artist to have to say, okay, I have to have this much, this much, this much. Um, I think that uh, if there are, I think there was very, something very powerful about incorporating um, historic events and incorporating nonfiction, right? So the example that I was using before about the nation, you know, this novel, the, the, 
this novel about these, a man and a woman, um, or actually the, the, a novel about two women who um, meet in a hospital in France 20 years after the end of the dictatorship in Haiti. What the, one woman is the widow of the former dictator, and one woman is the daughter of victims who died right um, at the hands of the former dictator. And what's really powerful about that book is that they, the names are, you know every, I mean there's literally, it's almost like a history book, the way that these events come up, the way that they mention incidents that actually happened. But what the imagined part is what these two women are experiencing and how they encounter each other and their interactions and what they're thinking. And then the author is really playing with the reader because she changes the names. She changes the name of the dictator. She changes the name of the country. She changes the name of the capital, but leaves enough similarity that there can be no question that who she's talking about, you know? Um, and so I think that there, when you know that history, when you're familiar with the history, there is something very powerful about reading that. Uh, but I don't think that it would, I don't think that not knowing the history would mean that you wouldn't um, be touched by that story to be Yes. Um, well, this has been a fascinating discussion, and I'm, I'm, I'm something I'm wondering, um, uh, as uh, somebody who deals with different genres and different disciplines uh, in addressing uh, these kinds of issues, is the potential for uh, publishing works of different genre together. Um, of different genres together, so that you might have, for example, a boxed set of uh, containing um, a, a, an ethnography with all the analysis and some history and everything, uh, and then um, a life history of a real person telling their own story in their own words, and then a novel or a novelette together with it. Uh, so you buy a set, and you know you'd be able to know uh, what it feels like. Uh, um, what it was like to live through it, um, and uh, uh, you'd have a framework and analysis for thinking about it, uh, uh, because many readers of, uh, of uh, memoirs don't have that, and you can op often read a memoir that says, you know, well, you did this, and then this happened to me, and then that happened to me, and then this other horrible thing happened to me, and then I escaped, and then another thing horrible thing happened to me, and you don't really have any uh, uh, way of, of uh, uh, Contextualizing um, who stands for what, or uh, what uh, uh, was derived from what previously, or uh, uh, how the people are related to each other ethnically, or in kinship, or uh, well, in you know, political books, party. Books are coming out that are like off, you know, sort of off, you know, you buy it off the internet, and the book contains the, the text, it contains film clips, it contains. Um, interviews, so, so that kind of thing will be coming. I really believe that yeah. the next, you know, in, in 10 years when you buy a book, you're going to be buying the, the, those elements as part of the book. But it won't come as a package. It will come, you know, on the internet and you download it from, from Amazon, yeah. I'm sure. And they'll take their big bucks and then, you know, leave us with nothing. But there'll, there'll be all those elements in it. But, but, at least, but at least they'll know where to get the other kind. Uh, or the other kinds from, from what you've just read. I also think that this is the beauty of the academy, right? Because I think that you can create a space like that in a classroom, yes. right? You can teach a class that Absolutely. that uses each of those elements, and even in academic books. Because, you know, as I mentioned in my book, I use I do look at different forms. I look at photography, and I look at drama, and I look at um, um, documentary films. So I think that there's a way that you know the academy presents us with a space where sure. you can you can have those that this multimedia, multi-sensory experience with these historic catastrophic events. And, and we do it, but but I'm, I guess I'm talking about reaching a broader public yeah. than, than the people actually come to right. the classroom. Yeah. I think that you could see. I mean, there are shows, right? The trial, there are multimedia art shows. Yes. So I think, it, um, I, yeah, I think that would be a great possibility. <laughs> well, it's time to end, and uh, we'll we'll be getting to much uh, plans, uh, but right before we uh, we we call it quits, I'd like to pass the. Uh, Report to Elizabeth Johnston as our treasurer, and she will be telling us a little bit about um, some other other things, other interesting panels that will be happening for the rest of this month. Okay, so as you said, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm the treasurer here at AMTU. 
and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the events we're going to have this month. We have a lot of events planned. Um, firstly, on April 14th, which is uh, next Monday, we will have a roundtable discussion on the recent municipal elections in France, and professors Vivian Schmidt, William Keeler, and Jamel Takai uh, will be there to talk to us about Firstly, why um, almost four out of ten people didn't vote, and why the Front National had such a great success. Um, on the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of April, we will be hosting three events, three days of events on homosexuality and Islam. Um, our events aim to approach a pertinent subject, considering the dire straits of gay rights in many majority Muslim countries. Um, our main speaker for those events will be Ludovic Zahed, who is a doctoral student at L'Ecole des Hautes Études de Sciences Sociales. Um, he is also the founder of the first mosque in Paris that is not only open but welcoming to homosexuals. Um, so uh, for these three days, the first day is April 21st, and Denis Pomanchet will give us a keynote speech on queer and gay identity. On the 22nd, Ludovic Sahed will give us an informal lecture on his personal experiences being a gay Muslim and his experiences in opening his mosque. On the 23rd, Ludovic Sahed will be joined by Annie Lontel by a Skype, who is a woman imam, and um, he'll speak to us. That will be a more formal lecture. Um, uh, next, on the 24th of April, if you will be holding uh, e-board elections, and all the positions will be open. So if you're not graduating this year, come present yourself. Um, lastly, on April 30th, Bertrand von Roenbeck, who is a French professor of history, will be talking to us about the discovery of America. He's um, a specialist on American history, but he is a professor in France. So I hope to see you guys at some of our events. And Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Watch TV for you.